Mr. Larry Bill. Uh, I'd like to address the bill that Mrs. Emerson ha has introduced, uh, where what you would do is, as I understand it, is that if you uh, would uh, hire you whenever you filled out your IRS 1040 form, that, and you were a businessman, you would say, "I will. I did not hire any illegal immigrants," and, and then you would be, uh, if, if it didn't happen, then you'd be thrown in jail. But anyway, right now, this is this is the thing: is we need practical experience, business experience, in uh, the government. We already have that law. That law is called the I-9, and on the I-9, the person that applies for the jo every job says, "I am, in fact, a legal." person in this in this uh, country and the person uh, the person that hires them signs the same thing under penalty of perjury I I hereby verify I tried my best to do it now we can see what happened to that uh, governor uh, candidate out in uh, California she found it she had a social security card she had a driver's license uh, the woman testified probably filled out an i9 said I'm in fact a legal immigrant now here's the downside of that whole thing is, if you're an employer and you're gonna hire somebody, are you gonna hire somebody if in fact you go, wow, here's one more chance that I'm gonna get dinged, possibly thrown in jail because of this new unnecessary law? Our next question deals with personal income taxes. The Bush tax cuts are set to expire soon. If you were in Congress, would you vote to continue them or would you let them expire? Our first respondent will be Mr. Rick Van Dieven. Well, if I was elected, I would most definitely extend the Bush tax cuts, but I don't think that goes far enough. I would like to eliminate the progressive income tax as well and replace it with nothing. I know that sounds a little radical, but that would only reduce the federal budget by about 40%. It would take us back to the spending levels of the year 1997. And I don't remember people jumping out of buildings or stepping over dead bodies in 1997. I think that the progressive income tax is the biggest penalty on production. And it, it stifles investment and personal savings and the the biggest thing that irks me about the income tax is that the government somehow or another ends up spending more than they can steal. Thank you. Up next, Mr. Tommy Sowers. Well, right now is no time to be raising taxes, and I would support an extension. But the reason why we're at this place is uh, because of the Wall Street bailouts that Congresswoman Emerson voted for. When I'm looking at this, what I want to do is get control of spending first. That's how we have to approach this. And as a military guy, I realize the amount of discretionary spending that's going into these costly overseas wars. I know how to fight terror. I've done it. I've had the mission to capture and kill terrorists. And spending $400 a gallon for a gallon of gas in Kabul, as we are today, and $2 billion a week is exactly what our enemies want us to do. So I worry about our debt. And right now we have the oldest and the longest serving Congress in the history of the Republic. It's one of the reasons why throughout this district people want some new blood in DC. They want some folks that can quit passing this buck down to the next generation, quit writing checks that our children are gonna have to pay over to China, and get some new blood in there that can make some tough decisions. Thank you. Mr. Larry Bill. If I were in Congress, I would uh, vote to extend all the Bush tax cuts. Uh, as Mr. Van Dieven said, the progressive income tax is a big demotivator for investment for people that uh, actually provide jobs. That's the truth. I think we need to also sponsor a bill and continue research into what's called the fair tax. Now what the fair tax is, it's a sale, national sales tax that's imposed on all new goods and services. And what you would do is you would pay your tax one time. It's designed to replace the AMT, uh, corporate income tax, social security tax, and, and uh, personal income tax. And if you don't have those threats 
of what tax bracket am I going to be put in by taking this action, you can w make decisions on an economic basis, not on a tax basis. As a businessman here for the last 17 years, uh, whenever I decide to take on a new project or look into a new endeavor, the first thing I have to look at is well, how will this impact me tax-wise. That's a totally ridiculous approach. With the fair tax, we would be able to tax illegals, immigra uh, illegal immigrants, people that are working under the table, uh, investors that hide their money overseas. And that's where we can go ahead and, and generate more revenue, which, of course, our spending needs to be cut. Ms. Joanne Emerson. Uh, I believe very strongly that we need to extend the tax cuts, no ifs, ands, and buts about it. And I'm, I'm very happy that Mr. Sowers has finally decided to support that, that position since this is the first time that you would commit to it. I will say there is no connection between extending the tax cuts and the, the troubled asset relief program vote because the tax cuts happened in 2001 and 2003 and the TARP vote was in 2008. The fact of the matter is now we do have a fragile economy and we actually ended up, um, quite frankly, not spending nearly the money on the TARP, thank God, because most of it's been paid back. But let me say that small business is the heart and soul of, of our congressional district, and to, to impose higher taxes on small business will pull the rug right out from under them. And you're the leader of your party, Nancy Pelosi, strongly believes that small businesses deserve to have their taxes increased. And so I can't understand why you would want to go and uh, be part of that, but needless to say, uh, there's no doubt that you don't raise taxes in a tough economy. Uh, we have to grow our economy. We need a pro-growth agenda. We need to look at all taxes across the board. I don't disagree that we need to, to flatten the tax code. We need to examine flat tax, fair tax, uh, lower corporate tax rates, but more than anything else, get rid of tax loopholes. Our next question deals with health care. What is your opinion of the new health care law, and in your estimation, is there a constitutional basis for it? We'll begin with Tommy Sowers. Well, it's clear that the final law that passed was too big, too expensive, and too complex. And the next Congress is going to be going there to fix and repeal portions of it. The only vote I cast in the last 12 months on health care was for Proposition C, because I don't believe in the constitutionality of the individual mandate. The question is now is what type of legislator will fix and repeal it? My approach has been different. I've been out on the ground talking with voters. And when I think about health care, I think about Jenny. Jenny is, uh, is a constituent here who gave her child a kidney and then was dropped from her health care coverage by her health insurance company. Prior to any reform, I think about Travis, a small businessman who, prior to any reform, his health care costs were going up 35% year over year, and he had to drop coverage. And I think about Jim, who runs a hospital down in the boot heel who prior to any reform was going to have to drop coverage to his own employees in the hospital. Congresswoman Emerson is a former insurance lobbyist who receives tens of thousands of dollars from the insurance industry to fill the campaign war chest. With me, I'll be fighting for you. With her, she'll be fighting for the insurance lobby. Thank you. Mr. Rick Van Dieven. I think that the new health care law is terrible and it needs to be repealed immediately. Uh, it does nothing to make health care more affordable or more available, and that's the underlying issue with the health care problem in this country. We need to realize that health care is never going to be free, and there's never going to be enough. There are some things that we can do to make health care more available and more affordable. Number one, first and foremost, repeal this health care act. We can repeal the HMO Act of 1973, and that was the act that made that took the decision-making process away from doctors and patients and put it into the hands of third-party bureaucracies. I would like to see the AMA's monopoly on medical licensing dissolved, deregulating the insurance industry to allow competition as cross state lines. I would like to make all drugs available over the counter. I would like to dissolve the FDA and replace it with a more agile free market alternative. 
And there are a lot of free market solutions to this issue. And that, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take legislators and, and people just, just to start discussing these things. Thank you. Ms. Joanne Emerson. I used to work for the property casualty homeowner side of insurance, uh, Mr. Sowers, and had nothing to do with the health care industry. But let me say this health care bill is first and foremost a sweetheart deal for pharmaceutical companies and a sweetheart deal for insurance companies as well. So just to set the record straight on that. But let me, let me say that you twice um, decided to support and said, I'm, I'm for the bill. I would have voted for the bill. Uh, obviously, you didn't read the bill or you've changed your mind. But, need, but nonetheless, it has nothing to do with health care, but it pays for the health care bill that you support. And so consequently, too, you can't say I wouldn't do this or I wouldn't do that. The fact is, is that unfortunately in the Congress, if 90 percent of something you like and 10 percent you don't like, you, you can't, you got to make a decision. And you can't be for prop, I mean, you can be for prop C, but then you should never have said you support it. Mr. Larry Bill. I think the current health care law is uh, unconstitutional, and I would vote to repeal it. Uh, completely. I was uh, really disappointed with the way our Congress approached this problem. We did, we do have problems in the healthcare uh, field. Uh, we need to acknowledge the technology has actually over uh, surpassed our capability to fund it. Uh, we need to acknowledge that there are problems out there as far as affordability of insurance. During that time, that 18 months they spent discussing health care, I would have preferred that our Congress would have put a priority on making things, making uh, the system easier to hire employees. I would rather have seen that they just take a small, uh, staggered approach. For example, uh, expanding the health savings account allowance. Uh, in fact, it was cut in half. And also what you could pay for it was also eliminated. But what that would allow people to that can't afford their health care to do is to shop around. And when you shop around, the price goes down. I would like to have seen a, uh, an allowance for uh, insurance companies to sell insurance across state lines. Uh, I'd like to uh, have seen, uh, like uh, Mrs. Emerson mentioned, that you don't, have, you don't uh, increase the size of the IRS task force whenever health care is a problem. And those are the things I would like to have seen done instead of the health care bill that we ended up. Our final question before the candidates are allowed to make a closing statement. The conflict in Afghanistan has gone on for quite a while now and has cost the United States billions of dollars. In your opinion, what is the best way to resolve the Afghanistan conflict? Mr. Rick Van Dieven. The occupation in Afghanistan is now this country's longest military conflict. It surpassed the Vietnam War in March of this year. There are many reasons that we went into Afghanistan. We were told that it was to bring the 9-11 terrorists to justice. This has been a mixed bag of successes. It seems like every time we cut one of the heads off of Al-Qaeda, three more pop up in their place. I contend that we are hated because we are over there. And I support a full and immediate withdrawal from Afghanistan and the Middle East, and all of the 700 military bases that are located in 130 countries around the world. Thank you.